Thank you for joining us for another Conversations with Suicide Widows. I'm Michelle Ann Collins, grief educator, grief coach, yoga therapist, some other stuff, and uh, joined by my friend Melissa Uchida, who is also a grief educator, yoga teacher, and lots of other things. And we have created this uh, series of recordings because we made it through losing our partners to suicide loss, our, our spouses, and we know that you can too. So we're hoping that we're bringing you helpful information. We are here for you. You can reach either one of us through our YouTube channels, our websites, our socials, all that information is in the show notes. And just know that there is help and hope. So today's um, session, we are going to focus on emotions and mindfulness. And the two things, it may sound kind of different, but it's really connected very deeply. And I want to open with a story for you. And it's not about losing my husband, Glenn. It's about a time after I lost my mom. And I remember the very first time that I felt joy. I lost my mom to leukemia in July of 2007 after a three and a half year battle. And it was devastating to me. I was, uh, she was my person. A conversation with her was a punctuation mark in between every sentence of my life. I just, she was everything. And losing her was completely devastating to me. About a month after she died, the other side of the family, my husband at the time, um, my first husband's family had a big trip plan. And I didn't want to go because I felt like I was so deep in mourning that going on something joyful like a, an Alaskan cruise was inappropriate and that I, I didn't have the energy. I mean, I, I could barely get out of bed at that point. And I was sick and I couldn't eat and all the things that Melissa and I have talked about with um, going through losing our spouses. So I'm on the cruise ship not wanting to be there, not being a good mom or a good daughter-in-law or a good spouse or anything, just, just really feeling sad and wrong. I was shooting on myself. I should not be here. I should not be doing this. I should be at home grieving. And one night we went to, uh, there was a dance uh, competition at the bar on the ship. And my brother-in-law asked me to dance. And I love to dance. I love to dance and all the swing dancing and we were doing all that. And I felt joy while we were out there. We actually came in second. We were headed for first place, but the other couple, the dude threw a backflip. Like, are you serious on a cruise ship? Ugh. Anyway, <laughs> so they won, but we came in second. And when my brother-in-law Mark was swinging me around the dance floor, I felt joy. This just bubbled up in my chest. And it was the first time I'd felt joy really in years, not just since my mom died, but since she had been diagnosed. And I immediately started crying because I felt such guilt. How can I feel joy when my mom's dead? And the thing is that joy, that moment that I felt joy was probably the most healing moment of the entire journey I had been on with losing my mom. So what Melissa and I want to share with you today, keeping that story in mind, is that grief is hard, but all emotions are welcome, especially feelings of joy and love. Thank you for that, Michelle. Wow. That's a beautiful story. And Two, I'm knowing that your mom would want you to laugh. She would want you to feel joy. She would want you to be out there swing dancing away and getting, and you know, right? Um, I think that's something that we forget too. Laughter is one of those incredible, powerful medicines that is free and, um, and we can give it to ourselves 
and it is so incredibly healing. I think laughter could be one of the most healing things on the whole planet. Um, and, but it, it's giving ourselves the permission to laugh. I remember when, after Nate died, the first time I laughed, and it was probably maybe six or eight months. I mean, it was it was a while, and I was on the phone with a girlfriend, and she was just telling this funny story. It was just like a funny, stark, snarky story, and I laughed so hard that my stomach hurt. Um, if I had been more hydrated, I probably would have peed my pants. Like, that's how hard of a laugh it was. And I went, oh, my gosh, I can't believe at that moment I felt normal. At that moment, I wasn't a grieving widow. At that moment, I was just a person having a conversation with one of my girlfriends and laughing and just a normal human being. And it was such an amazing gift that she gave me. Um, it's one of those things that we, and it's just overlooked. People would rather watch the news or they'd rather watch the, uh, the reality TV or, or something that's really heavy. Um, and sometimes we just need some comedy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And we, we've talked over the course of the videos of things that you can do, put in your toolkit to try to help you when you're having a difficult time and certainly watching comedy. If there's any comedy out there, any comedian that makes you even smirk a little bit, happy hormones happen and they are healing. So when you are laughing or smiling or some of the doing the other things that we're going to talk about later in this video, the mindfulness techniques, it gets your body into a state where it can heal. And we've talked over and over now through this series about how tied together the mind and the body, the emotions and the body are, and how important it is to support the body and keep yourself in the calm side of your nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system to heal. Mm -hmm. So laughter is, I mean, you've heard, you've all heard the expression laughter is the best medicine, right? Mm -hmm. It, it really is. And with suicide loss, there's, there can be such heavy guilt. There can be so much guilt that it can really extinguish the, the light emotions, the, the joy, the laughter, happiness, bliss, all, all of the, the things that feel lighter, yet it's okay. And this is what we want to reassure you 100%. Every emotion that you have is okay, especially the lighter ones, because when you're feeling those lighter emotions, you are healing. Yeah. And that emotion, thank you. Emotion is, emotions and feelings are not bad. We think of good feelings, bad feelings, negative emotions, positive emotions. But the truth is emotions are like little signs telling us about what's actually going on. It's almost like you're driving and the GPS says, turn left, next light, turn right. Um, a uh, speed camera reported ahead. <laughs> Please watch your speed. Um, and that's what emotions are actually doing. What normally in life we are running away or avoiding or ignoring uh, the what we would call negative emotions: fear, guilt, shame, embarrassment, um, jealousy, uh, anger, anger um, rumi rumination, ruminating. Um, all of those, anything which is going over, you know, repeating kind of that negative story over and over, we tend to do that. And so we spend a lot of our energy running away from those emotions. Well, when we're in guilt, if you can, guilt is so, such a strong, powerful, such a grief is such a strong, powerful emotion that if we let ourselves be with the grief, usually, um, David. David Kessler says, we would rather feel guilty than feel powerless. So we choose guilt. And with when there's suicide, guilt is going to be a part of it. It doesn't even matter who it is. It doesn't have to be the spouse. I mean, they're everyone who knew that person will walk away feeling some type of guilt. Could I have said something? Could I have done something? Oh my gosh, I just saw him last week and I was in such a hurry that I just didn't even acknowledge, didn't even acknowledge them. Could I have 
is there anything I could have done? So if you're carrying any of that kind of guilt, it's really important to let it go and to, and to, to just know that we would rather feel that negative emotion of guilt than to feel powerless when really it's okay to feel powerless. Death happens to all of us. Everyone is gonna die. We don't know when it's gonna be, but no one, no one gets to escape death. Um, and that really at the end of the day, there is nothing anyone could have done that would have changed the outcome. And when we are willing to let go of those other emotions of guilt um, or anger, it allows us then to be with this raw emotion of grief. And I, you know, started to just call it grief. I said, oh, there you are. We watched my son and I, my uh, even my older girls, we watched Inside Out, the Disney's mm -hmm. Inside Out, over and over and over and over because I wanted him to understand what the emotions are that they all have different roles and to be, be able to identify them as separate from himself. So it's not that ang he, anger is him, but it's actually, oh no, anger is just over at master control and he's kind of controlling the joystick and making the decisions. Oh, fear is now. And then what happens when sadness and joy are gone? Well, sadness and joy, when they're gone, then you have fear, anger, and disgust left running the ship that we call ourselves. <laughs> and that's a pretty terrible place to be, but that's kind of what happens in grief is that joy is definitely gone from the mix. Um, happiness is gone. Connection might be gone. Um, safety, the feeling of safety might be gone. And what is that? That leaves fear running the ship, right? So mm -hmm. it, it's getting to identify those feelings and then going, oh, I, I see that right now safety has gone. I don't feel safe. I don't feel safe living in this world because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, and, that, and to know that that's a normal response to death by suicide. It's a normal response to trauma. It's a normal response to a loss, um, this feeling of powerlessness. And I think we have to embrace the powerlessness at some point. You just kind of have to go, Okay. All right. This is it. You know, right. I guess I am. Acceptance. Acceptance. It's such a, that is a hard word in grief. It's, it's really hard. And um, you're, you're uh, bringing to mind a story that I have my, uh, a, a very wise uh, yoga teacher friend of mine showed me one time I was upset about something that was happening uh, in the administration at, at one of the yoga studios where we worked. And she said, Michelle, look at my hands. And she held up her two hands like this. And she said, here's how we want things to be. And here's how things are. And everything in between is the source of suffering. Meaning that if we could just accept how things are, because that's how they are, then we wouldn't suffer. Now, much, much easier said than done. But that's why we have the video that we're doing right now is emotions and mindfulness because mindfulness if you are aware of your emotions and know how to manage them which we've talked about in all our previous videos you know working through them physically taking care of your physical body all of these things accepting them letting them flow if you're able to mindfully manage your emotions then they don't manage you and you won't have these unwanted outcomes like falling out with your family, being disappointed, constantly suffering the loss and grief over and over again. So one tip I have that I'll start with is when you feel something, right? You're going to feel something either in your body or your emotions. I feel, recognize it. Start by noticing. That's mindfulness. Instead of lashing out like the anger comes in and you immediately lash out to do something about it you yell at somebody you hang up the phone you kick something please don't kick things you'll hurt your foot so instead what you do is you notice right now I'm feeling anger and then it becomes so much less powerful because you're aware of the emotion rather than suffering from the emotion I'm just watching. He's so cute. So 
instead of saying, I am angry, taking it on as your identity, you switch your view by mindfully understanding that you are experiencing anger as a process of emotions that rise and fall. All emotions change. I'm sure you don't feel right now how you did half an hour ago or six hours ago, even in grief, even in anger, uh, I mean, in uh, trauma, your emotions will change over the course of time. And if you can identify them, I'm feeling angry right now. I need to, remember in the last video, I was demonstrating punching the pillow. That's a healthy release of anger. Instead of, I need to call up my sister-in-law and tell her how much I hate her. That's not a healthy release of anger. And it's probably not a good idea in general. So these things, when we're, you're muted, Lisa, when we're becoming aware of our emotions rather than being run by our emotions. This is a mindfulness exercise. You know, it, with emotions, I love this, um, use this visual of standing at the shore, at the beach, barefoot, and the waves wash up and they just kind of tickle your feet and then it recedes, goes back into the ocean and another wave comes up and tickles your feet and it recedes. And emotions are like that. When we understand this wave of whether it's anger, whether it's grief, whether it's fear, whether it's jealousy, whether it's joy, whether it's contentment and happiness, they all come up and they just tickle our feet, they're brief, and then, it, and then they recede. So if we notice that you're, you're like, well, my anger stays or my grief stays or my sadness stays, uh, well, grief is separate. So I'm going to actually, I should remove grief from that. But what you, oh no, emotions last much longer. What it is, is that we're thinking the thought that activates the emotion. So the feelings are just, you know, neurons firing in our brain because we think a certain thought and it produces this this reaction. So if you do notice that, and if it's an unwanted emotion, notice what the thought is. And then, and this is kind of advanced work, right? Notice what the thought is and we replace it. Um, we use you a just different kind of, one. You use a different thought, right? So I um, love the image the, of thoughts being like a buffet. I'm not a big fan of buffets because I think people regularly overeat at them, but if you had a buffet, wouldn't you always choose joy or happiness or one of the more, one of the emotions that feel better, uh, you know, than the things that are heavier, <clears throat> anger, frustration, fear. And you can do this with mindfulness practices. You can choose to let go of that thought that brought up the emotion that didn't feel desirable. And you can choose a thought that brings up an emotion that is more desirable. Mm -hmm. And when you find one that's stuck, that you go, I, I can't get rid of it. This is now this is super advanced work. But then we go, what what is this emotion trying to tell me? What what do I need to know about myself? And is there anything that I would like to change? Because the emotion is, is letting you know something. It really is a big blinking neon light saying, hey, look at this, look at this, or danger, look at this, or boundaries have been crossed, or, you know. So it's about instead of numbing, numbing the feeling or running away or being really quick to pick up the phone and to do something to be busy, that's my go-to is being busy, um, instead asking, Take a couple breaths, breathe into your belly, breathe into your heart. After a couple of breaths, say, all right, what is it that you would like me to know? And then just listen, because <laughs> often it's something, it, it, it might not even be as big and scary as we make it out to be. You remember that Dr. Seuss book, The Places That Scare You? Oh, the places you go, the places oh, yeah. you go and the boys traveling and all, all and it, big, hairy, scary things, you know, and they look so big and overwhelming. Um, and really, we all have those big, huge, overwhelming fears. Uh, and guilt is a, a big one. Shame is a, a big one. Some of these are really tough 
to face. And yet we are all built with this courage to face them. And the tool is, is simply to be, to sit and be with it. It's a kind mm -hmm. of like, all right, I, I can look at you and I can face it. What, what do you want me to know? Yeah, that is advanced. I'm going to go back a little bit. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. And we can put that in here somewhere. I'm going to, I'm going to tell everyone my, uh, trick or my the the way that I find to take control of my emotions and not let them control me and it has an acronym stop no it has an acronym story so I like to write my own story I'm a writer I have books out I write poems I love to write so that's why story appealed to me as an acronym there is an acronym stop but um, that's not the one I use so the each letter represents an action you can take when you notice you are feeling something you don't want to be feeling. So first you stop. So this is a challenge. Say, I'm going to use something really easy, not, not go into uh, when we have the grief and um, guilt, but it can be used for those things. I'm just going to use something really relatable, got cut off in traffic. Okay. So you're mad. So first, before you go up and honk at them or maybe show them a hand gesture or whatever, you stop, not in the middle of traffic, but physically, emotionally stop. Take three deep breaths. Now, if you can take three deep breaths, you are going to let a lot of the power behind that emotion go and get back into, we talked about how trauma brings you into the lower part of your brain. You can get back into the higher thinking part of your brain. And if three breaths isn't enough, if you're still like ready to go strangle that person, take three more. Mm -hmm. And then the O is observe and observe the different possibilities that are open to you for reaction. Well, I could go strangle that person. I could honk back. I could maybe understand, maybe this person's in a hurry right now. They cut me off because their mom's in the hospital and they're trying to rush to the hospital or they're late to pick up their kid from school and they're feeling profoundly guilty or they're late for a job interview and they need that job so badly or maybe they're just a jerk and they're just a bad driver but there's a lot of possibilities under the o right so mm -hmm. maybe Maybe find your compassion, your inner compassion for that person. Maybe make up a story for them if you just think they're a jerk. And then R is respond rather than react. So you're going to respond to the situation from the higher functioning part of your brain. You're angry. We talked about ways to move anger through punching a pillow, something like that. Take a walk outside. Uh, and then you get to not suffer from re your reaction, pulling up next to them, honking really loud, you know, causing maybe an altercation. You respond with compassion for yourself. Wow, that really sucked. I hated getting cut off in traffic. And compassion for them. They must be having a crap day to drive like that. And then why is, because I always love to celebrate a job well done. You say, yay, I did it. Yeah. I, remembered, I remembered to write my own story. Now this is not perfect. It's a practice. So say you did pull up and honk and, you know, and gesture and whatever. And then later you got home and you were like, wow, I kind of escalated that situation. I was kind of a jerk. So you say, yeah, that's what the why is for. Yeah, I'll do better next time. But you can go through the process of story anytime you are faced with a challenge. And with practice, you'll end up responding much more often in ways that you find are health supporting than reacting in ways that you will find not supportive of your health. Mm. I love that. S T O R Y. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Always Yay. celebrate it at the end. Got to yeah. celebrate. Yeah. Really important. Any other mindfulness tools that we want to leave people with? Yeah, I think um, the five cents is really good. We've talked a lot about breathing and just keep in mind, breathing is a mindfulness tool. 
Um, Melissa touched on this a tiny bit last time. Um, the, there's a way to get back in your body if you're feeling really anxious and um, just can't stop ruminating and that is connecting to the five senses. Um, do you want to speak on it or you want me to? So we have our five shirt, we, um, our five senses. We can see, we can hear, we can taste, we can touch, we can smell. And when we are really spinning, uh, in, in yoga, we call them the chitta vrittis, these <laughs> tornadoes of thoughts. And if you write with a thought, there's never one. They're like tornadoes and they suck everything around into it. Have you ever been at a really wonderful event and and not been able to even enjoy it because we're so wrapped up in the, in the chitta vrittis. So to get ourselves out of that, what do you see? What do you touch? What do you hear? You know, you name one thing. I see a, a card. I touch this table. I hear uh, birds chirping. I smell my puppy um, and I taste mint. So uh, and that brings us right back into the physical body, into the present moment, into the here and now. Yeah, it's a it's a beautiful practice. It can be done anywhere and it doesn't take very long. So when you when you feel like you really need to get back into your body to be present, to let go of whatever rumination you have connecting with the senses is really, really great. Yeah, and that's it really is such a powerful thing um, because that the especially the first, you know, the early the early stages of grief are so painful. Mm -hmm. And then the other mindfulness practice, you may not be aware that this is a mindfulness practice, but it's one that I call the emotional parachute, and that is gratitude. Uh, anytime you're in gratitude, you're not in fear, you're not in anger, you're not in guilt, uh, it, it's, it's the antidote, and gratitude is so powerful it can pull you out of an incredibly dark place, a deep spiral. And I'm saying this from my own experience. Um, I have uh, many people who are touched by suicide become themselves suicidal. And I did have a time where I was in such a dark place that I was thinking about following Glenn out of the world. And just quickly, if you are ever feeling anything like that, call 988, call a friend, talking about it can almost always diffuse the situation. So take care of yourself. But I was in bed and I was really, really, really sad and, and just wanting my pain to end. And I had a friend of mine text me, how are you? And I couldn't even answer. I, we were supposed to have a phone call that day and I couldn't even respond. And so after this went on for a little while, she knew that I was in just a really deep, dark place. And she said, look around the room and tell me one thing you're grateful for. And I, I, I couldn't get myself up to gratitude. It was like gratitude was so far away and she just kept at it. Thank goodness. I'm so grateful for her. And finally, I realized I was laying on some really soft sheets in my dark, depressing bedroom. Uh, my sister had given me for uh, Hanukkah or birthday the year before. And so I told her I was grateful for my soft sheets. And when you can get into gratitude, what that did for me was it released some happy hormone chemicals in my brain and allowed me to pull myself up just a tiny bit out of the muck and realize that there's there's stuff there's purpose there's life there's there's things to be grateful for in every moment of your life there's something to be grateful for and hopefully you can find something not hopefully you can find okay. something even if it's just the air you're breathing to get yourself out of that deep, dark place. So gratitude to me is one of the most important mindfulness practices you can, you can learn and practice. Yeah. It's one of the, one of the most important, I think being a human practices and it, and, and, 
at the same time, you've lost a partner, you've lost your spouse, or some of you have lost other people. Um, and there might be times when you go, I have nothing to feel grateful for. Um, and we get it. We so get those times. I had been practicing gratitude um, for decades with a daily gratitude practice. So in the morning, Nate and I would write down three things we were grateful for. And at night, we have a seashell next to the bed and we would each hold our seashell. We got this out of a book called Magic. It's a book on gratitude and how gratitude changes your life. So um, hold, hold our seashells and run through the day and think of what we were the most grateful for that day. So I had decades of this gratitude practice. And after mm -hmm. Nate died, I really was like, I, I couldn't even, there wasn't even the, it, it, it at first it, it wasn't like anything and then it would be slow where I would run my hands under warm water and it would just I would feel the warm water and go I am so grateful for warm water um I would watch sunsets every night that first summer I am so grateful for all of these amazing colors that I get to actually see um smelling my kid's head you know those, those <laughs> or something or something that but it doesn't have to be anything big it could be i am so grateful the other night we had this insane thunderstorm it's one of the things i love about where i live is we have really intense summer thunderstorms and i said i am so grateful to have a roof over my head and to be shielded from this rain and the lightning um so it might require, and if you don't feel it, don't force it. Cause this isn't about forcing. We, it's really about feeling the gratitude in your heart and gratitude is incredibly healing because it alters our state of being at any time. So it can take us from this deep pain to almost a feeling of relief and I'm okay. Um, in a matter of seconds, but, but it's gotta be something real. It can't be made up. You're not trying to force it. So if you taste something that tastes good, or if you see something that's bright and shiny and makes you feel kind of good, oh, I'm so grateful for that. And that that really is enough. It's Yeah, and it's, it's like a muscle. It's a practice that you can actually get in shape, in gratitude shape, grateful shape, um, yeah. where you, you retrain. This is why it's a mindfulness practice. You're retraining your brain instead of seeking out the things that are fearful, you know, that are fear provoking, anger provoking, frustration provoking, you're seeking out the things that bring you joy, the things that feel good. And you can actually change your perception of the world with this practice so that there is more in your world that brings you joy than brings you pain by practicing gratitude. Yes, we are, uh, this goes back to our last um, episode, but we are programmed, our nervous system is programmed to look for danger. So when we're in grief, that goes on overdrive and you're literally out there when, looking for danger because the body is trying to protect itself. You're, it's going, something terrible has happened. I need to protect, protect, protect. So. The gratitude practice, what that does is, because we get it when if you go, I don't have anything to be grateful for. I'm so filled with fear. I'm so filled with shock. I'm so filled with guilt or anger, all these things. Um, imagine standing in a big, huge warehouse and you are holding a flashlight and it's pitch black. Okay, So there are all these things within this building that you're in. You've got a flashlight, you shine it in one corner and you see a table. Okay, there's a table, that's what you see. You shine it in another corner, you see a trash can. Okay, that's what you see. You shine it up high, maybe you see some bats or, you know, I don't know, whatever. But we are controlling, our perception is like this, if we think of what, what it is that we experience, but there is all of this that exists around us. So what the gratitude practice does, it, is it training the muscle, like Michelle was saying, it's training us 
to be able to shine the flashlight on something that produces a good feeling, on something that produces a positive feeling. And what that does is it helps to raise our vibration so all of our systems function much better. Everything starts to function better and it does take practice and it it needs to be a tangible practice. It's not something like, I'm just gonna be, I'm just grateful. No, make it specific. <laughs> Where are you shining the flashlight? Shine it on something and feel the gratitude. Stay with it for a couple of minutes. Do this every single day, um, maybe several times a day, but definitely in the morning and at night, I think of our, our day as like a gratitude sandwich. I open with gratitude <laughs> and I close with gratitude um, and all the stuff that happens in the middle that you can change up throughout the day. <laughs> um, yeah, that's great. I love that. Yeah, keeping a gratitude journal and any journaling at night, that's another really great practice. Um, you can just write anything onto the page, anything you're feeling or thinking. And it can kind of be like when we were talking about digestion earlier in the in the last video and how you seeing and smelling like gets your pre-digestion going. Journaling can do the same thing. It's pre-digestion for your mind and emotions before sleep. So it, it can promote healthy sleep as well. Okay, one takeaway. What is one thing that you would want anyone who has had a loss, uh, a suicide loss or, to know? I think the biggest thing that I would encourage is self-compassion. You've already been through one of the worst things it, human a human can go through, the terrible loss. Don't pick on yourself. Be nice to yourself. Be kind to yourself. Treat yourself as if you were your biggest supporter, especially if the people around you are letting you down and not able to support you the way you, you need. Figure out what you need and take care of yourself and don't should on yourself be nice yeah good so what about you melissa what, what's your big takeaway um the one thing i would want people to know is that this is one event yes like michelle said the worst event of your life most likely and and if you have the courage and the self-compassion to work through your grief and to work through the pain, that you can find meaning in this really terrible situation and you can make a difference in other people's lives to make it even better, um, to, to make a difference in the world. And that that might seem far off right now, but just keep it kind of in the on the back burner or in your back pocket where at some point if you decide to make meaning from this and to serve humanity because of your pain, by what you've learned through your own pain, um, that that will make it so our loved ones have not died in vain that our loved ones have died and, and because of their death, because of their life and because of their death, that we are doing something to make the world a better place so that people don't have to suffer, but that we can find um, ways of healing that suffering. That was a yeah, lot. That was that's probably beautiful. No, yeah. it's beautiful. And, and, you know, the other thing to keep in mind about that is this doesn't mean you need to go take a grief educator course and become a writer or, you know, uh, or run grief groups or any of that. Meaning can be found in your presence, your gratitude practice, all of the things we've talked about in our video series. It, it can mean it, it, if you can smile at someone on the street or have some extra compassion for yourself or anyone else because of what you've been through. Um, it, that makes the world a better place. Yeah. Yeah. That's. Yeah. All right. Well, I think this is a wrap for now. I'm guessing you'll see us again uh, in the future, but we hope that you have gotten at least something out of this video series and 
We are here for you. Again, I remind you, you can find Melissa at melissauchita.com. You can find me at inhabitjoy.com and socials, more on YouTube. We're around. Um, if you like out. the series, we would love to hear your comments too in the chat. Um, you can subscribe to our stations and let us know what you would like to hear more of, what you would like to learn more of. So that would help us also. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Love and light. Love and light.